time is more important than any dollar amount ever will be. So if I can create that time, we'll have the choice to say no if we want to. But the ultimate goal is also to spend time with my family. Welcome back to another episode of the Hybrid Real Estate Professional Podcast. Today, I am joined by Mike Sullivan, who goes by the handle Inspired Landlord on X, where he has quickly become one of my favorite accounts. Mike works in the live news industry in Boston, owns two rentals, and is a very proud husband and father of two young kids. What I love most about Mike's content is how he shares his experience balancing his real estate investing with his family life, and he does so in real time so others can learn from him as he goes. I'm a rookie when it comes to real estate investing. I'm a licensed realtor in two states, but when it comes to real estate investing, I am learning every single day. But if I mess up, it's not going to be the end of the world. Um, because I'm not going to look at anything as a failure. I'm going to look at it as an opportunity to be better next time. We dive into his pathway into investing, an amazing story about his why, and how he plans to use real estate investing as a tool to build a family-centric life. I loved our conversation, and I know you will too. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Hybrid Real Estate Professional Podcast, where we dive deep into the intersection of career, family, and finances. Learn the mindsets, tips, and strategies to help you on your personal journey to build a life of abundance and purpose for you and your family. Now, here's your host, Karen Amin. All right, welcome to the Hybrid Real Estate Professional Podcast. Today, I'm here with Mike Sullivan, aka Inspired Landlord. He's actually one of my favorite accounts on uh, Twitter, also known as X these days. We came into each other's orbit a few months ago. We started commenting back and forth on each other's posts. And I just love the way you write and the way you handle your account. And you just very share the story and true to your name, you inspire other people to embrace how accessible real estate investing is for just anyone that's looking to get started, which is very in line with the message that I promote here on the show. Right. So I would love to just give people more exposure to you and your story and hear you introduce yourself in your own words. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you for having me on, Aaron. I really appreciate it. And to be honest, your content inspires me. There's a handful of people that I follow very closely on X, and you are certainly one of them. And I feel just, you know, this is our first time speaking, but I feel this natural connection between the two of us because we're at the same stage as far as family life goes. Myself with a five-year-old and a three-year-old. You have a two-year-old and then brand new baby, brand new twins. A lot of the reason, a lot of when we talk about our why, I feel like we are very closely aligned on that just from the tweets that I read from you. And I'm on your email list and I enjoy that those as well. So yeah, that is why I feel just this connection with you. And then as far as the real estate game, you are much farther ahead of me there. But that also inspires me because you can do it. We can do it. Everyone can do it. As we work as a team, we inspire each other and I'm um, just trying to spread positivity in, in, in a world that needs a lot of it right now. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I agree. There's definitely some commonalities with the family and the young kids and how we integrate them into our real estate investing journey and the fact that you're still working full time and what I understand to be a, a pretty demanding job. Can you give us a little background on just yeah, what what is your job and industry you work in? And how did you also get into real estate investing? Yeah, of course. So I've been in the local news industry for 17 and a half years, television news. My wife and I both work at one of the stations in Boston. She's an anchor and reporter and in the mornings. And then I'm an executive producer, a manager for our night side shows for our 10 and 11 o'clock late newscast. Got into it right out of college many years ago and I've just moved around, lived in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, worked there for six and a half years before we both moved back up home to Massachusetts, which is where both of our families are. We built a house back in 2016 after we paid down our student loans. We made the sacrifice, thank God she had us, but we lived. I lived with my mother-in-law for three years when we first moved back and we just crushed our student debt um, and all of our consumer um, debt as well. Saved up for our first house. We built a brand new house. We just wanted to be one and done, hopefully. And we've been here for seven years. And over those seven years, we've watched the equity grow in that house and the value in our home grow tremendously. Obviously, a lot of people during COVID enjoyed that. To get into the real estate game, it was last year. It was the summer of 22. I started, I've always been trying to find multiple sources of income, passive income. Real estate is certainly not passive. But there was just this 
podcast, Dan Lane, the Rental Income Podcast. I've been list, binge listened to that all summer and there got a point, there came a point where I couldn't listen to any more episodes. I, I knew as much as I wanted to know, as much as I felt I needed to know before I actually took action. And then in the, it was November of 22, we built, or excuse me, we bought our first property, uh, a condo. And we were able to get the funds for that using a HELOC, which we took out on our primary. So we had a HELOC for 200,000 and we were able to use that and other funds to purchase the first property, which was, it's a two family, but we only own one of those units. So it was a good way to dip our toes in. There's no association dues, no fees or anything, which is nice. It's $4 a month for a shared water pump. So that's nothing. So that was our first taste of it. And then I stayed on the hunt looking for property number two. And then just in October of this year, so 11 months later, we were able to buy our first two family. That is in Rhode Island. And we have our tenant moving in very shortly, the second tenant. So that will be filled both units. So we're excited about that. And we have, we took out a HELOC to, for the down payment on this one as well. So we're really going to focus this year, 2024, on crushing HELOC principle as well. So I will stay on the prowl for new properties and opportunities that pop up, but we really want to make a concerted effort to crush some principal on that HELOC because this is where our comfort level is, but we don't want to get any more uncomfortable. We want to get even more comfortable. So that is the plan for 2024 as it stands. God, it's so cool, man. It's, it hits at every kind of stage of how, like, I, I love talking to people that put together a slow, patient, methodical plan to enter into real estate because it's different. And part of what I like with running this show and the people that I talk to is I don't really speak to the, there's plenty of shows out there that say, hey, here's how you go from zero to a hundred units in six months or a year. And that's not, that's not relatable. Correct. That's not what most people can do. That's not what most people should do. And I use the word should very sparingly because I don't think I'm in any position to tell people what to do. But honestly, like the advice that's out there uh, that's prevalent across a lot of mediums is here's how you can buy as much as possible, <laughs> take on as much debt as possible right. and scale as fast as possible. Absolutely. And the way you described it, where you bought a primary home and you let some equity build up, you use the HELOC, which is a very powerful tool to buy your first rental. You did that in a way that you found a place where the economics made sense for you and you found another place, which I'm sure, like you said, you're listening to podcasts and learning along the way so that I'm sure your understanding of the fundamentals just grew over time. Absolutely. But you've built a portfolio that makes sense for you and your family. And then now you're already, instead of just, hey, how can I lever up and buy 10 more properties? You're already thinking ahead to like, how can I get a handle on some of the principal pay down? And so that's just like such an important part of the journey that I think a lot of people gloss over, especially you and I spend a lot of time on social media and the internet. Uh, I just don't see that message as clearly in most places. So I think it's really cool how you've got your, your start. So beyond the principal pay down, and like you said, you're always keeping your eyes open. Do you have a way about which you set your real estate goals? So it sounds like you still want to grow and you have a, a runway ahead of you. You want to continue to acquire real estate, but like how do you think about that for you and your family? My goal is three to five as of this moment, as of today. Anything can change. Three to five would put us in a comfortable spot where it would allow us the freedom to make the choice of work optional. So that that is the ultimate goal. But the ultimate goal is also to spend time with my family. Time is more important than any dollar amount ever will be. So if I can create that time, my goal is to make enough cash flow to cover our expenses. And once we get to that point, we'll, be, have, we'll have the choice to say no if we want to. We're not there yet. We have very demanding jobs. And thankfully, we both really love what we do. And we wouldn't change that. But just having the freedom of choice is what is appealing to, to real estate investing for me. So as far as goals go, I think short answer three to five properties and to be able to teach my children how to do it one day and ultimately pass them on to them when they're of age and when they're ready to do that so i think that's the plan for now what about you well i love it it's over time things change a bit right so like we bought eight properties over the course of the majority of those we bought within a three-year window so we had a period of what i consider to be 
quick scaling. Like some other people, like I said, those zero to hundred people might think that's not hyperscaling, but to me and to our family, that was a lot, but a lot of that happened before we had kids. Now we have three kids. So it's things change over time. I think the pieces that you pressed on, right? Like being able to afford ourselves the option. I use that phrase work optional too a lot. And a lot of people misconstrue that to think that means that I want to leave my job, which is not the case. I enjoy my career. I gain a lot of wonderful skills from my career. This whole hybrid real estate professional brand is predicated on the idea that the skills we gain in our careers apply to making us better real estate investors. And I believe and am fully bought into that idea. So work optional simply just means it affords us the, the flexibility we have young kids right now. If we want to take some time to really focus on that and not have to have both my wife and I like grinding it out at work, I mean, these early years, we want that option. So I know I'm not answering your question directly, which is the same one I asked you, but I don't think of, I don't measure it by, I want to get 10 doors that each pay $150 a month in cash flow. I tried thinking that way earlier on. And I wouldn't, I would be lying if I said that wasn't part of what I was thinking when we bought those original eight. But now I see that there's a bigger picture in play. When I put those eight properties into a spreadsheet and I say, here's the loan balance, here's the rates, here's the remaining principal, or here's, and here's the current market value. I can see the big picture and, and say, okay, which ones of these are serving towards the goals? Would it make more sense to pay one off? Would it make sense to even sell, which is, I know, another controversial topic for a lot of buy and hold investors. And so I'm starting to get to the point, six years into investing in real estate, three of those years were that kind of sprint to buy those eight, where we're now taking a step back and saying a, a, a deep breath and saying, here, what's actually serving us and pushing us towards our long-term goals, which is that flexibility, financial freedom, and, and yeah, having those like kind of those options. So I don't exactly know, and I'm okay with not knowing what that means just yet. And that's a part of why I've spent a lot of time focused on like education and content. I think documenting the journey and giving back some of the perspective that's gained as you go is one of the best ways to pay it forward to other real estate investors. And that's, again, a huge reason why I do this show. I don't make money doing this show, right? This is for fun. And it's because I love connecting with other investors um, because I think that there's just, there's so many people out there that want to get into it, but don't exactly know how. And the more they hear stories like yours and stories like mine, the more they're more likely they are to take some action. So content is how you and I came into each other's orbit. And I think you actually do this better than I do where you have this kind of ongoing dialogue. I remember you, you closed on your place in October and you were like narrating your experience in a really, just like, it was such a relatable conversational way that you were, you were teasing things out over the days. Hey, I'm getting ready for the closing or I forget exactly the specifics, but there were a couple like speed bumps or last minute like adjustments you had to make. And it was this very, hey, day in the life. This is a day in the life of, of you as an investor. And you do a really good job at that. And I was poking around on your blog a bit before this too. And so my first question is, what, is, what inspires you to take the time to actually tell that, those stories um, on the internet? Yeah, great question. And thank you for the, the kind words. So it goes back to my career. So being a, a manager now, I used to be a producer and I, my creative outlet is writing just like yours. And when I became a manager six and a half, seven years ago, I got away from that and I started managing people and personalities and systems and things like that. And the writing wasn't, I wasn't writing anymore. So I started a side hustle back in 2018. I do email marketing for an eye doctor and just share stories with about his patients to his patients. And I started that. And then I've always just loved sharing stories. I think sharing stories in general, one of the most powerful things you can do. If you can make someone feel something through your words, I think they will remember how you make them feel and they will keep coming back to your content. My goal on Twitter right now is to document, to learn, to make connections and to inspire and to be inspired. I like that you brought that up because I was documenting day to day through that process. It's to also hold myself accountable and to look back on it and learn from it. 
I'm a rookie when it comes to real estate investing. I'm a licensed realtor in two states, but as another side hustle, but when it comes to real estate investing, I am learning every single day by doing, and I want to learn by doing, and I want, I don't want to mess up, but if I mess up, it's not going to be the end of the world um, because I'm going to learn from it. I'm not going to look at anything as a failure. I'm going to look at it as an opportunity to be better next time. So just sharing my words of wisdom, I don't even call it words of wisdom, just my thoughts and my journey is just to hold myself accountable, inspire others, and make the connections, like I said. So that's really what it is. That's so cool, man. Yeah, when I started, so I joined Twitter yeah. back when it was Twitter in 2008, and I sat on the sidelines. I didn't really use the app for probably the better part of a decade. And then in March 2022, I joined a writing program called Ship 30 for 30, which uh, the whole idea is that write 30 little micro essays in 30 days. Right. And so I went from not writing at all, even though I really liked writing, to publishing every day. And that was like, I think it was March 7th, 2022, if I'm not mistaken. And I just never stopped. And similarly, I didn't even know necessarily what I was writing about, but I just was exploring my thoughts and ideas and like what resonates with me and also what resonates with others. And how can I find like the point where I feel like I'm having a conversation that's meaningful to me that's also contributing in some meaningful way to the public conversation. And that ultimately led me towards the real estate investing and towards this brand, towards the newsletter, towards the podcast. And now I'm even like doing uh, coaching and all that because I realized that there were a lot of people that were in that position where like they wanted, they wanted to invest, didn't necessarily know how to get from, I think you, you said earlier, like you, you had listened to enough podcasts to the point where your head was full of the knowledge, but you had to start like reducing the pressure on your head by taking action. 100%. And that moment is like a critical point where some people just need a little bit of help. And and I, I started working with coaches not too long ago, which made me realize that, hey, there's there's some stuff that I have to offer as well. And so I say all that because it's like, it starts with just telling the story. 100%. And then it, it's amazing how it can evolve over time if you just let it play out organically. Definitely. I remember one very specific, I'm going to butcher it, but you had, there was one of your tweet dialogues that was like, you had to do something unexpected and you were watching your kids and you had to jump in the car with them and drive with two hours or something yeah. and, and deal with it. Yeah. And it was just all those like everyday relatable moments I think are, are so fun to watch. And there's very few accounts that do it as well as you do. So it was really interesting. This is the first time I've asked you about it, right? And to hear what's your goal behind it. And I also didn't know that you had that slide hustle. Yeah. So what do you... Do you see the, the, do you see it expanding beyond just posting and, and documenting? Do you see it moving towards something like a newsletter or a, or a show or anything like that? Or is this really just for fun? At this point, I would say it's more to make connections and for fun, just because the, our full-time career is very demanding and we have the two children, which we adore more than anything. And just spending every waking moment I can with them, like, Right now, it's pretty tough, Aaron. I'll be honest. This year has been a shock to the system as far as seeing my son um, start a preschool back in September. And the way that my schedule is, I see him for an hour a day when he goes to school. An hour a day. I get home from work after the late news at 12.15 in the morning. My daughter or son will wake me up. Usually it's, Daddy, I love you. Wake up, which is the sweetest thing in the world. But that's at 6.30 in the morning. My son's on the bus at 8.15, so it's, let's eat breakfast. Let's take your medicine. Let's do this. Let's do that. We got to go. Out. It's freezing out. Don't forget your jacket. It's a tough hour. And then I don't see him until we do it again tomorrow. So that is a driving motivator for me to, to get to that work optional, to, to that choice, that, that freedom of time. And it's so powerful. And if I can share one more quick thing, like back in 2018 when my son was born, this is the story behind my why. My wife was in labor for 31 and a half hours before they finally asked her, hey, I think we need to do a C-section. And I was like, yes, please, God. And my wife was like, yes, please, God, let's meet our son. And they got her comfortable, walked into the OR. <clears throat> and I could feel like I was you know, holding my wife's head and whispering like, you got this, I love you. And I could feel the doctor just tugging so hard. And he was tugging so hard that he was grunting. And the, our son uh, came out. 
but there was no crying. And that was the one sound I wanted to hear. And I knew something wasn't right. And I saw them, you know, whisk them, whisk my son away. And my wife asked me, she's like, hey, is everything okay? And it was the hardest thing that I've ever had to do in my life. I lied to her face. I said, yeah, we're, everything's fine, babe. We're going to see him in one minute. And then I heard them call for respiratory. And I was like, oh, God, please don't end like this after what my wife just went through. And it was about two minutes. It felt like 20. And I started hearing him cry. And I stayed tough in front of my wife right there. But when I got to go see him, I broke down. He was the most beautiful little thing in the world. I hugged the nurses. I said, you saved my son's life. Thank you. And when I got back to my wife, I said, he's the most beautiful thing in the world. I can't wait for you to see him. And that was the defining moment where my life changed. I loved my wife more than I had ever loved her before. And then she's, after all she went through, she's like, hey, let's have another kid. And we're like, what? But that was the why. That was like, that is why I want to spend as much time with my family as possible. And I don't know a more powerful reason behind why than that for myself. Ever since then, man, I've just been on a mission to, to make, make that cash flow to spend as much time as possible with my family. I'm sorry if I got a little emotional, but it's, it was a powerful thing for me. So that's my why. No, th thank you so much for sharing that. And yeah, I, I just went through a delivery about a month ago. We didn't have uh, crazy complications, but I do, there was one of the two twins did have to get a little support and it was uniquely terrifying feeling. And similarly, if they take them out of the room where your wife is, and I feel worse for my wife than for me, because I was at least with, with our son. But yeah, it takes an ex experience like that. It gives you all the perspective and all the motivation that you need to stay connected. Because yeah, it's a beautiful thing when you have a kid and you realize how precious it is to bring a life into this world. And you mentioned, again, so many parallels where our daughter's only two, but I spent that hour with her in the morning and it's definitely difficult just getting her to put her clothes on yes. and it's a lot of hustle and I wouldn't cheat. I wouldn't trade it for anything, but it's not, it's a little different than getting to go spend two hours unstructured at the park yeah. with no deadlines. Yeah. And those are the types of time that you want to ultimately end up with is that like unstructured fun time, which is hard to come by when you're, when you got two people working full time. And in your case, you guys have offsetting schedules. So no, I love that. And the first five years, which is what you just are going through and what I'm going through too, is I almost feel like now is a more important time to try and have that time freedom than five ages, 10 to 16, when they don't even want to see you anyway. Yeah, totally. So I think there's a really tough balancing act that a lot of parents go through. And that is why a lot of people are drawn to real estate, right? It's, hey, if we can alleviate a little bit of pressure and maybe one of us works part-time, which is what we've been doing right. in our family. My wife's been able to work part-time mostly while our daughter had her first couple of years. Uh, so just like all those little levers you can pull to, to buy back a little bit of your time or, or get a little optionality, it definitely like puts, puts a greater purpose behind it than just, hey, I want to make an extra 300 bucks a month to cover my uh, electricity bill. <laughs> Absolutely. So where does this all, where does this all lead for you? And you mentioned your kids, mm -hmm. right? So you said you want them to be, you want them to learn how to be involved in the business and kind of, obviously they're very young right now, but it's, you already take them along for rides to yeah. check out the properties and they're, so they're learning a bit by osmosis, but like, how do you see this playing into to their lives yeah. in the long run? Good question. So I don't want to ever force anything on them that they don't want to do, but I like taking them on rides. Like you said, like my three-year-old asked if we were going to an open house soon. I was like, what three or what am I doing? What three-year-old? But I think down the line, I think of college and I've had the conversation with my wife, like our kid's going to go to college. It's either going to be a million dollars a year by then, or it's going to be completely free and the whole system is going to be changed. So we don't know. We don't have a college fund for them. We have custodial accounts and we're just buying with our extra funds, we're buying them in indexes, VOO, to be honest. But we're letting that grow over 20 years. And I'm hoping that, God willing, it's enough for some kind of down payment on their first property. I, my wife and I, we got into the real estate game late. We bought the primary home mid-30s. But had we known to house hack, we would absolutely 1,000 would have, you know, we would have participated in that five times over and 
been done building the portfolio by now. But like I said, we started late, but I want to be able to teach our children how to get right into it. Ideally, they get into a trade, which is in super high demand, a plumber, electrician, something that you can't ever get someone to pick up the phone for these days, start their own business, and then just buy a bunch of real estate. That's that's the, the goal there. But again, whatever they want to do, I'm going to be there a thousand percent to back them. But ultimately, I think just motivating others to do it, to take action, just being a good human being and being willing to give without expecting anything back in return is a super important thing to do. So I think if I can just raise my kids to be good people, to be good human beings, that is all I want to be healthy and helpful to others. So. Yeah. I love the connection that you have towards um, your role as a parent and just what you're trying to do for your kids. And so I have a similar attitude where I don't want to prescribe to them like what they should do when it comes to occupation or you should invest in real estate or you should do this. Again, I I try and be wary of that word. Um, But I also think that when they see, especially some of the outcomes that can occur, right? If you guys continue down this path and that maybe it will buy you some of that optionality to spend more time with them, or maybe it will create this like longer term snowball effect where um, it can benefit them um, or it can help enable them to do something that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to do. It like unlocks that entrepreneurial spirit in their head. And I think that's something I want my kids to understand, right? I want them to be financially responsible and understand that any privilege or, or benefit that they have from anything that we provide them financially is not to be taken for granted. And so I want to see them be able to be stewards of their own money. Yeah. However they want to deploy it is up to them, but but not to be just totally frivolous and wasteful to really put it into play in a meaningful way. And you and I actually really like the point you just brought up. It's just like, be a good person, do things that have impact. And then that altruistic nature, right? Like I'm, the older I get and the further I get in my life, the, the more I want to find meaningful ways to give back. And I know everyone says that, and it can mean something different for everyone. But to me, it's like the, it's the small things, right? I don't know if you've ever been part of one of those lines where you're in Starbucks drive through and you're like, let me cover the drink behind me. I started <laughs> a few of those. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I know that one's a little, it's a little more, okay. Somebody at least knows yeah. there's a little, it's not a hundred percent selfless. Like you're still attached to it, right. but it does feel good. Of course. And so like just having those moments where it's like, hey, do something or pay someone a compliment or find a way to just like, put something positive out into the world every day. Yeah, I'm all for that and trying to install that on the next generation. Yeah. It's just weird how those connect, right? Like, people think of real estate as like a slimy game to play, yeah. but it really doesn't have to be, right? And that's again, why part of why I've been so drawn to following your journey. And, and I know that's part of what you and I engage with uh, each other on totally. online. Totally. So who are some of the other people that, you know, that you've found in your internet journey that you think are good creators or embodying the same ethos that we're talking about? Lawrence Biggs, Briggs, Briggs. Yeah, Briggs. Yeah. Lawrence Briggs. He, his story is phenomenal. He's, I'm sure a lot of people know of him He's from Louisiana, New Orleans, and grew up in a, a tough spot and has come out with several rental properties of his own and just his words and his story. He was one of the first people when I first got onto X last year on, on in this account that just was instantly drawn to everything he had to post and say. And I would love to have a conversation with him one day just about his his story, that, which I've heard several times, but just to hear it from him, just so I could take even more away from him and, and hopefully provide something back would be awesome. The Frugal Gay, Tom, he's, I like his content and a lot of his perspective and he's very inspiring and I think we're both at the same age, 39, can relate to him in a lot of ageisms, if you will. And then there's one guy who's close to me in Massachusetts. Uh, he's in the Worcester area, Frugal Mogul. He's got a lot of good content yeah. that I like as well. But yeah, there's a lot of people out there. But th- th- those three and yourself, to be honest, Aaron, are the, probably the four that I follow close, most closely for sure. Um, I am very humble to be included in that group because those guys are, are killer and they give a lot of them. Um, great value away. Yeah. And I think the amount of information flowing around on X, the amount of information flowing around there, people have threads where they explain like complex deal analysis and strategy. Yeah. There's just so much information there. 
and people that are willing to engage with each other. It's a great place to get that inspiration and, and really a lot of tactical advice too, like on how to take those next steps and move forward. So I, I want to ask one thing though, right? You said you, you love Lawrence's story. You'd love to connect with him. What has stopped you? Man, I just myself probably thinking I'm too busy and just not actually reaching out to him directly in DMs and saying, hey, can we hop on a call? I think that's probably the only thing. So you know what? You just inspired me to take action on that. Today's episode is brought to you by the Remote Real Estate Academy, the community I launched last year where I personally coach investors and empower them to buy rental properties anywhere in the United States. My business partner, Nathan, and I have a collective 15 years experience with over 20 cash flowing out of state rental properties. We provide a step by step playbook on how you can build your own portfolio and start accessing the life changing benefits of real estate investing starting today. Go to remoterealestateacademy.com for more info, or better yet, Shoot me an email at Aaron at AaronAmin.com with subject line R-R-E-A, and I'll throw in a special bonus for podcast listeners who join the Academy. Now let's get to the show. Yeah, I think it's that's another thing I've learned, right? Obviously, if you reach out to an account that has a million followers or one of the huge influencers, you may or may not get a response. But one of the things I've found and one of the things I've experienced is people are willing to respond and engage, especially if you reach out from a place of authenticity and explain something about like people are out there voluntarily sharing information about their stories, right? So they're not receptive to people commenting or reaching out and saying how, which parts resonated or which maybe didn't, or even asking questions like, why would they be out there in the first place? So I think one, that's one thing a lot of the people that I've interviewed on this show are people that I met online. And I think hopefully there's a lesson in that, that there's a lot of inspiring people out there that have uh, similar backgrounds, similar aspirations and points of connection. And you would never know if you didn't take the time to potentially reach out and, and at least drop drop a line. Um, good point. Very good. That's one of the reasons I, I love having a show. And I think it's fun to get to have conversations just like this. And there's other people that are, are willing to do the same. Do you have any other groups that you're a part of or communities or like, who would you say is like your kind of real estate investor network? Because we all have one, but I don't think everyone... When you go tell your aunt or uncle, yeah. start talking about cap rates and yeah. stuff like that, this guy's crazy. So who's your like inner circle? Yeah. To be honest, the people that I interact with most about it is the community on X. But with that said, my group of four or five best friends, we've all talked about it. And you know what? That was actually, that's when I got up. That's when I started listening to the podcast was last summer at a golf tournament with my three best friends. We're all talking about ways because they're a couple business guys and we're all talking about ways to like get into real estate because we figured that was a really good path. And I was like, huh, I got to take a deep dive into this. And I think I listened to the first podcast on the ride home from that golf tournament. So you just brought back that memory. But yeah, I, one of my friends ended up buying, they have one rental property and then I'm the only other that has taken action so far. They're bigger into the stock market, most of them they'll ask me every time we get together, Hey, how's it going? How's this? And I'll just be honest with them. The pros, the cons, the good, the bad, the ugly. And they're like, oh, I got to do it. I got to do it. One of my friends actually bought some land, but no house on the property. So I don't know what he's going to do there. He might build another personal residence there. But so, yeah, I think my small group of friends, we talk about it a little bit, but really it's the community on X. I've looked for like local real estate groups meeting in town where I live and just haven't they're either they're meeting when I'm at work or they haven't, you know, met in like a month or two. And I'm like, how consistent are they? So if I do a little deeper dive on that, I could probably go in person as well. What about yourself? I know you obviously, yes, remote, there, but anything in person? Yeah, there's a couple of things I want to say here, yeah. which uh, I think are important. I didn't have, I didn't read my first Bigger Pockets book until after we owned four houses. I didn't join any masterminds or have even go to a RIA event or anything like that until around then as well. And it is absolutely not a prerequisite to be part of some expensive online community or a local meetup in order to take action and buy your first or second or third or fourth yeah. rental property. There comes a point where I think people want to layer on groups of people that are doing the things that they want to be doing. And to me, so like when you, to answer your question, Recently, I've joined um, a few different groups and communities that have investors that are at that like 10 to 20 property level, because I know that 
there comes a point where the scale becomes hard to to manage with a full-time job and a family and all that, right? So like, I'm very proud of the eight properties that we bought and the systems that we've set up. We live a thousand miles away from our closest rental. We live 3,000 miles away from our farthest rental. We have three different markets, three different teams, three different systems. And so the idea of scaling beyond that is difficult unless we build a system and a business that's um, meant to scale to that level. So part of um, engaging in online communities and masterminds is to engage with other people who have done that. And so I just wanted to make that point that it's absolutely not necessary right. to get started. But at some point for me, like I, I, I know that to take the next step forward in my business, I need to put myself in, the, in those types of rooms. Perfect. So to answer your actual question, the, the main mastermind that I'm a part of is called the Action Academy. Um, a lot of the people I've interviewed on this podcast are from there. It's run by this guy named Brian Lubin. He runs a, a podcast of the same name, Action Academy Podcast. And he's done a great job of curating a group. I think there's just under 200 people in there, but there's a, usually he individually interviews and screens each person. There's like a requirement. You have to like own minimum of three rentals or some equivalent or have some kind of, so he does business acquisition and real estate investing okay. is, is who makes it into the group. And so there's that kind of like filtering. And then there is a not negligible price tag on it. So like the people that actually are in there are invested and bought in. So that's been a, a, a really good accelerator. I know you mentioned you're on my newsletter, right? I've written about some of the experience of uh, they're really pushing you to establish a bigger vision, set really audacious goals. Mm -hmm. And, and really hold each other accountable to reach them. So I think that's been a really positive influence on me as far as like, how do I get from where I am now to where I want to be? Because I think at some point, it is hard to go too much further on your own. Great. It's not that it can't be done. I am one to ask for and engage looking for help if, if I know I need it. And to me, unless I like, throttled back in other areas of my life, like my career, my family, neither of which I'm willing to do, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have any more capacity or energy to dedicate towards real estate. So smart. So that was the kind of calculation I did. Smart. The second part of your question, do, do I have any local meetups? I haven't done anything local yet. Been a little busy. Outside of, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we moved here in August and then we had the twins on November 30th. And yeah, just been settling in. And 2023 was a year of massive change for me across the board, nonstop, one thing after another. And, and so honestly, just we sold a property in, in 2023 and we bought zero. And I'm fine with that yeah. because we did those things for a very specific reason. And it was what I was saying earlier, right? Like when you look at everything holistically, it's like we have this portfolio, we have these assets, they're making this much cash flow, but they also have equity and that's your money. Sometimes your money can be used in a better way than being parked in rentals. And I think we had a difficult decision grappling with the idea of selling a property this summer, but ultimately that's what we needed to meet this season of our life. And so we did it. And again, these are big decisions where had I not been surrounded by other investors who can help me see the big picture, you know, that, hey, it's not like these eight rentals aren't the whole world. Like there's other houses out there if you sell one, like you can buy more later, like just those little moments of getting unblocked and, and looking holistically, those things really help me and they justify the price and admission and some of the energy I put towards them, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Smart. Yeah. And I'm happy to share, I think one thing we touched on here, which is important is that before you join the expensive mastermind, just start by shooting one of us a DM and asking us how, how we got our start, right? Totally. Yeah. I'm glad you opened my eyes to that. It, it takes, what, 60 seconds to do? I'm going to do it as soon as we hop off this call. Yeah, there's a little, there's some nuance and art to it, right? Yeah. Like you don't want to just be like, hey, do you want to jump on a three and a half oh, hour yeah. Zoom call with me and tell me everything about your life? Right, no. You know, that, that one might get glossed yeah. over, but, but hey, Lawrence, your story really resonated with me. I've heard you on a couple of Bigger Pockets podcasts. Here's a, a pitch about what I do. Yeah. And here's maybe a specific question I had. Right. I would be very surprised if uh, you don't get a response, whether it's him or someone else, right? right. Who doesn't want to help the next kind of generation of investor, right. especially if they're like trying to do good things in the world, right? Yeah, yeah so. totally. Totally. Yeah, thank you. One thing I want to touch on before we wrap up, yeah. you mentioned you're a licensed real estate agent in two states. 
What was the uh, rationale there? And what are you doing with that? So when I first started the side hustle with the email marketing, I was also doing Facebook ads at the time when they were super duper. And I was knocking on businesses doors and around my city. And one of them was a real estate office. And I did her Facebook ads for about a year. And then at the end of the year, she was like, hey, why don't you become a realtor? And I was like, yeah, why don't we become realtors? And when my wife was pregnant with our firstborn, she was working part time at the time, early in her pregnancy. And she was like, hey, we got the time to do this right now. Let's take the class. Let's get our license and let's do it. So she was actually the one who pushed us over the edge to get that. So we've been licensed for five years in Massachusetts. And then just earlier this year, back in January, I got the Rhode Island license. And that was just really filling out paperwork and taking a lead paint class because lead paint is very prevalent in Rhode Island. It's actually the number one when it comes to cases of lead paint. Unfortunately, Rhode Island is number one. So they are super duper strict on that. But yeah, that was the only transaction actually I've made in Rhode Island is the property that I bought so far. So I haven't done any business for other clients in Rhode Island, but I just knew that we would be looking in Rhode Island for rental properties. And instead of giving the commission to someone else, I'd rather take it and use it toward down payment or repairs and fixes and things like that. Two things I love about that. One is that you did it with your wife and it's something you guys did together and you were probably, it sounds like you're both passionate about, got to share that experience, which is great. And two is, yeah, it gives you that option to save the commission and I'm sure access to MLS and do yes. a couple other kind of tactical things to help you get a, a slight edge oh, as well. Totally. Couldn't agree. Yep. Awesome, man. Well, we've been going for, I think, about 45 minutes now, so I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I enjoyed getting to know you a bit. It's the first time you and I have chatted uh, on video off off platform, Yeah, but I know my audience will love hearing your story too. Any final words you want to leave with them? And then also, where can they uh, find you to connect with you? Yeah, sure. I think final words would be just thank you, Aaron, for providing the great content and the platform that you have. And I think the message to everyone is just be a good human being, please. Just help other people. Remember that time is more important than money. There, if there's something to chase, it's time with loved ones. Make a smile, make a stranger smile, inspire others to be better than they currently are and just enjoy life because it's the, the most precious thing in the world. So I know it's kind of cliche and soft, but it's good to hear and Put your head down in 2024 and, and take action would be the other thing that I'd like to share. As far as finding me, I'm on X at Inspired Landlord. Enjoy connecting with anyone who's willing to talk about real estate, stocks, business, family, children, just life in general. That's where you can find me. And then my website is uh, inspiredlandlord.com. There's a few blog posts there as well. So that's where you can find me. True to your name, I am also leaving this uh, feeling inspired, and I'm glad we got a chance to connect. Thank you. And we will talk again soon. I hope to have you on the show here again, uh, talking about your third or fourth property, or even better yet, how you were able to find a way to get those options and spend more time with your family. That would be so, an honor. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks again, Mike. Okay. Yep, we'll talk again soon. All right, take care. Thank you for making it to the end of today's episode. As you may know, podcasts are very difficult to grow organically. If you're getting value from today's episode, I'd deeply appreciate if you can take 30 seconds to leave my show a five-star rating and review. This will go a long way to helping me reach more listeners just like you. Thank you so much in advance.